from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome again to another edition of Face the State. I'm David Parker, MTN political analyst, joined today by MTN chief political reporter Mike Dennison. Every four years we elect a president and governor here in Montana. Unsurprisingly, those two races receive a lot of attention from the political class. Often overlooked, however, are the state legislative races, which are perhaps even more important to Montanans in terms of the types of laws and regulations into which we come in contact in our daily lives. This year, we have an unprecedented number of contested primaries on the ballot on June 7th. To help us unpack this, we are joined again today by State Representative Matthew Monforton and political consultant Tim Warner. Thanks again for being here. Mike, let's start with you. You wrote a piece recently about the upcoming primary races. How many primary races are we talking about that are contested on, this, on the 7th? Well, the ones that, uh, that really matter, we're talking about 20 Republican primary races in legislative races across the state, and maybe one Democratic one, but the Republican ones are the ones to watch. But, and that's because we have a, a competition between candidates from the moderate wing of the party versus the conservative wing of the party. And in, in, all, in all of these races, you know, the winner of that primary, I think, is going to be the representative or senator from that district because it's a Republican-leaning district, and therefore that's the race that matters. And so if, if the conservatives win a, a large amount of these, they're going to control their caucus and their legislature. And the reason I say that is because after the November election, I think it's pretty certain that Republicans will still have majorities in the House and the Senate. The question is what type of majorities? How many moderate Republicans will be in there who might break away and work with minority Democrats on some of the key issues as it's happened in the last two legislatures? So Matthew, why do we have this open, essentially ideological warfare in the Republican Party in, in the primary process this time around? Well, we've got this civil war that's going on in the Republican Party between conservatives who take the Republican platform seriously and those who don't. Candidates, conservative candidates who want to fight corruption in government liberal Republicans who benefit from corruption in government. That's where the fight is. Tim, why don't we have this for the Democratic Party? Why, why, I mean, we don't really have any serious primary contests on the Democratic side for the state legislative races. Well, I think, you know, something new happened this cycle in the Democratic Party. We actually have uh, a leader in Nancy Keenan running the party and people working with her around the state very effectively to recruit candidates that are kind of oriented toward creating jobs, a strong economy, and kind of local issues. They're not fighting ideological uh, warfare like the Republicans are. Uh, they're really focused on running the campaigns, knocking doors, raising money so they can get their message out. And uh, you know, it's going pretty well uh, as opposed to previous years uh, for the Democratic Party. Even though typically, and over recent history, the Democrats have picked up seats in the House and the S State Senate. Um, I don't know that they'll pick up enough seats to take the majority control of either house. But, you know, the policies that the governor and the Democratic Party have been promoting the past several years typically have been passed into law because there has been a lot of people that have kind of adopted a more common sense approach focused on creating jobs. Uh, that, that have sold out Republican principles on behalf of Bullock and Democrats. Yes, unfortunately, that's happened in the last few sessions. It will likely happen again this session if Bullock is fortunate enough to get reelected. That's, that's the problem that the Republican Party is facing. Well, let's talk about a couple of those issues that are dividing your caucus. That, number one, the infrastructure bill. I think it was a key point that's being made in a lot of these races that was defeated in the House by conservatives. And now a lot of the people running now are saying, I would have voted for that, that created jobs, and the people who opposed that were opposing it purely on, well, principle, I guess you might say, yes. but principles that, that, that they think really didn't hold forth on that particular time. The, what, what about that? The, the problem that we're seeing is the Montana Contractors Association has gone out, recruited several candidates who are going to do their bidding, who are going to continue to support these so-called infrastructure bills that are really nothing more than pork barrel bills. They're being financed by the Montana Contractors Association and conservative Republicans, conservative Republican incumbents are, are facing stiff challenges because of that and because of the fact that the state party leadership is not supporting conservatives whatsoever. That's a big problem for us. Yeah, I, th I just think people are tiring of the ideological warfares in the Montana state legislature. We may actually, for the first time, have a legislature that doesn't require 70, 80 vetoes. And, um, 
you know, these, you know, the Contractors Association, the Chamber of Commerce, these are, these are business oriented groups that really do want a strong economy and do want to create jobs. They want to feed from the government trough. That's what they want. They, these are not free market folks. These are people who want increased government spending and they're willing to sell out and have their candidates sell out to Democrats and to Governor Bullock in order to get that. That's the problem. And, and now, I, I know you're going to say pork barrel, but it is the responsibility of government and those of us who pay taxes to put in roads, put in bridges, put in infrastructure that absolutely. supports our economy. I understand that there's a few projects here and there that you're going to call pork barrel More projects. Than a few. And they may be. Museums, gymnasiums, that's not, that's not infrastructure. And the other problem is we've had a surplus for, for years and years. Mm -hmm. Let's pay for these infrastructure projects, which I agree with you, we need some of them. Let's pay for them with a check rather than a credit card. That's the problem that conservative Republicans have with the kind of pork barrel bills that we've seen the last few sessions. What was the fundamental issue in terms of the infrastructure bill in the last legislature from your perspective? So, uh, Matthew, so what was, you, you didn't support it. I didn't, I, and I was, uh, I was the one vote that killed it, uh, although I suppose you could say that about <laughs> it. every Republican in the House that, that voted against it. Uh, th there were two big issues for me. Number one is this so-called infrastructure bill was not an infrastructure bill so much as it was a pork barrel bill. We had, I think it was $30 million for a new museum in Helena or to refurbish the museum that they have there, uh, another $10 million for, for a gymnasium at MSU. I mean, let's, let's be honest and call these kind of projects what they are. Let's not put them in an infrastructure bill and try to pass it uh, in, a, in a deceitful way. But Tim, why, I'm I'm sorry. But yeah, and why, I think why is uh, why do you call these projects pork projects? How are they any more pork than building a sewer or road somewhere in a rural area? I mean, they're they're providing jobs. They're they're providing business. Why, why do you label those pork we, as we opposed to provide, anything else? We could provide jobs by spending gobs and gobs of money on things that don't really matter. The the important point is to be honest with the voters about what it is that we're spending or not spending. Infrastructure is traditionally thought of as roads, sewers, bridges, that sort of thing. Schools? Schools. That, and there, yes, there were some schools in the infrastructure bill, but there were also lots of other things that shouldn't have been there. And they shouldn't be financed on the backs of our children and our grandchildren when we have a surplus, and we've had a surplus for years, that's getting fritted away on, on things that, that simply don't matter. Let's pay for these kind of things using a check rather than a credit card. You see, this is why I think Democrats see an opportunity, because kind of talking down the economy and using a bunch of political rhetoric is becoming less and less popular. People have kind of figured out that people that are celebrating the death of in infrastructure bills in Montana are Republicans. And the governor... Some and, Republicans. Well, some Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> You're right, because of the rift, it gets kind of confusing. But that may be an opportunity for the Democrats to pick more seats up because the rhetoric and reality they're not really uh, mixing well. But of course, a lot of these primary contests, though, are not in competitive districts. Right. And when it comes exactly. to the general election, they're basically, these are Republican seats, and that they're going to be that no matter what. It's the Contractors Association trying to buy seats, trying to buy candidates in the House Republican Caucus. That, that's what this amounts to. But wasn't this, now, um, refresh our memory, Mike. Back in 2014, there were also primary contests uh, among the Republican side, but there are fewer, right? And it was the other way around. A lot of conservatives were then challenging a lot of the moderates. Well, I think that that, that really began in 2008, 2010, mm -hmm. where conservatives were targeting moderates and taking them out in primaries. And, and then I'd say in the last couple of years, it's been fairly even. It, you know, the, the moderates have organized and fought back. They have their own pack. And, and now I, I think they're probably more organized now than the other side. It, it, as, as Matthew mentioned, they've got the help of the contractors, a lot of business groups, a lot of main line lobby groups, lobbyists. Uh, that's just supporting these people. Well, it's interesting. If you want to put this into a broader context, so if you want to put that graphic, first graphic I have up of, on I ideology, um, and what this graph basically shows, and this is the party unity voting and, and ideology in the House, the U.S. House of Representatives, and this goes all the way back from 1879 up through the current Congress. And what you see in the blue at the top is that Republicans have become moved much further to the right over time. And if you see down at the bottom the red line, the dark red line is the one that's important. That's the Democratic Party. And they've become more liberal, but, but they have not become a lot more liberal as much as the Republican Party has become a lot more conservative. And what's interesting, to put this in further perspective, if you look at the US House of Representatives, 
the last time we've seen, also in the Republican Party, this much uh, polarization, but also ideological diversity. What that chart doesn't show is that the Republican Party nationally has become much more ideologically broad at the same time it's become conservative. So it's become overwhelmingly more conservative, but there's also a lot of moderates within the Republican Party as well. The last time we saw this was in 1909. And what happened in 1909 is the Republicans basically had a coup against their Speaker of the House. And what's interesting is that you do see the same phenomenon in state legislatures. You do see Republicans moving further to the right. You see Democrats moving less so to the left. But what's interesting, and this is a question I'm going to ask Tim, is that in the Democratic Party here in Montana to date, using another measure, is actually more ideologically spread than the Republican Party. The Republican Party is having this, this fight. But the Democratic Party actually has more ideological variation, but no fight. Why? Well, I think in, in recruiting for people who run for the legislature, the Democratic Party has been very uh, focused and organized and able to get good, high-quality candidates that are typically moderate and kind of jobs-oriented people. They also have a lot of respect for things like public education. And I think they've recognized that Party primaries can be destructive. And I think what we're seeing on the other side of the aisle with the Republican Party is all out civil war. And um, maybe at some point, the Montana Republicans will be able to do what the national Republicans have done with Trump, where they're all coming together behind Trump. You know, it's possible that the Montana Republicans can all come together behind Matthew Monfort. It'll never happen until we have <laughs> closed primaries, because open primaries are what enabled uh, these liberal Republicans to attract crossover Democrats to win in these closely contested primaries. So that's something we've got to change. Otherwise, the Montana Republican Party and our agenda, will, it will always be a farce until we are able to control our primaries and able to have Republican nominees selected by Republican voters. But in this election, this primary, are you telling me people are going to cross over when they can vote in the, in the presidential primary for Sanders or Clinton? They're going to cross over and vote Republican? It, it will not be as right pronounced this, it'll not be as pronounced this cycle for precisely the reason you, you state, is that we have a, a, a presidential battle going on on the Democrat side that will likely keep a lot of the potential crossover Democrats at home. But conversely, we have several candidates, several liberal, phony Republican candidates who are making overt efforts to get crossover Democrats to support them. Uh, we'll take a look at one of those examples with Steve Fitzpatrick. He is a liberal, phony Republican who is making overt attempts through mailers to get Democrats to cross over and vote for him. So who do you think is going to win these primaries? Who do you think is going to come out on top with these contested primaries that are kind of the key primaries we've been talking about? I, I think for this cycle, uh, unfortunately, the phony liberal Republicans are going to make some headway because they've got a lot of money from the Contractors Association. The Teachers Union is going to help uh, bring Democrats over. There's a lot of institutional pressures that we're dealing with to try to get conservatives reelected. The good news for conservatives is that we're starting to see grassroots organizations pop up, and in particular, the county Republican Central Committees are starting to step up, and they're starting to make endorsements, and they're calling out the phony Republicans that are, that are running in their county. So hopefully there's going to be some, some, some counterbalance there. But if people know about this, I mean, I don't know how closely people follow these races, but if people know about this because of coverage, we're talking about it, how can you just dismiss the fact, if they win, that maybe that's what people really want? Because, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't paying as close a attention as, as the political junkies like, like we are. And the liberal Republicans and their money are very good at, at creating a deceptive image of themselves, making them sound like conservatives when, in fact, they're really not. As information gets out there more and more, hopefully that'll start to that'll start to change. One of the biggest problems we're facing is that Commissioner Modell is using his office to silence conservative voices and silence conservative organi organizations that do a good job when they're allowed to of getting the information out and telling the voters who the real Republicans are and who the phony liberal Republicans are. So, Tim, is it true that uh, Democrats are out there, uh, people who are supporting Democrats and who believe what Democrats want are trying to infiltrate and get people to cross over and choose the, the right person in these contested Republican primaries? No, I think that'd be a losing strategy. Uh, and I, I, it's just really not happening. But, uh, you know, I think it's more important to recognize that 
when people do start paying attention in these races. Take House, Dix, House Dix, District 60, uh, Deborah Lamb. Livingston. Yeah, in Livingston. Uh, Deborah Lamb is going to the National Convention, enthusiastically voting for Trump, wants to sell off public lands and gut our public education system with private voucher systems. Whereas Lori Bishop, who's running against her, works in the schools every day to try to keep kids from committing suicide and keep kids from dropping out of school. And you know she's very, very well known in the community and well respected. Um, you know, Lori Bishop's going to have more opportunity to win there when you know juxtaposed with that kind of extremist agenda that Deborah Lamb represents. Uh, well, that's, that's a different situation in the sense that that's not a primary contest of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. But, but, so that you're you're suggesting? Are you suggesting that some of these primary contests, if the conservative wins, the Democrat might actually have a chance? Well, the Democrat has a much better chance if the conservative wins because the conservatives are out of touch and they're being very extreme and I think people are tired of conservatives celebrating the death of infrastructure bills. These primary battles are taking place in hardcore Republican districts. Right. It's not going to affect the mathematical uh, balance of Republicans versus Democrats. What it will affect is who has, who has a working majority in the House and the Senate and that clearly is going to be the Democrats. They're going to have a working majority because their minority plus uh, 12 or 13 liberal phony Republicans are going to vote with them on every important bill that comes up in 2017 just like they've done the last three or four sessions. And you don't see that as a kind of validation of the, the more moderate business oriented a Bullock administration approach? No, I, I see that as um, interest groups like the Montana Contractors Association buying the votes of people in our caucus and doing it successfully. I, I have to hand it to them. They're, they're doing a good job of buying our votes, of buying our caucus, and that's what grassroots Republicans are so upset about, is they, they don't want that. Here's the fundamental problem in any primary contest. It's, I mean, voting we know is about information. You've got information to make decisions. And primaries are difficult because one of the biggest keys information you've got partisanship is absent, right? You vote in a Republican primary, you've got two names in the ballot. It's hard for you to figure out who stands for what. So in terms of the primary challenges to work, you've got to give voters information. You've been looking at the money. What does the money picture look like, Mike? Well, the money for the, in these contested Republican primaries, the, the main races we're talking about, the money for the moderates is coming from, as Matthew said, is coming from contractors, uh, is coming from business lobbies, um, Northwest Energy, I'll, 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 you know, the mainline business lobbies. It's coming from lobbyists, it's coming from fellow moderates in the legislature, it's coming from a lot of business people in the community. And on the conservative side, it's coming from fellow conservatives and some political action committees, not that many, but you know, Matthew is right that in terms of the money that had been out there that was sometimes called quote unquote dark money. It was actually money from uh, conservative groups spending money to attack uh, some of the moderates, that's not out there as much this time. And I think one of the reasons is because of the crackdown by Commissioner Modell on some of these groups. And I would disagree that it is a totally partisan thing, but that is a factor out there. So I, I looked at the seats that have these contested Republican primaries, and I looked at your numbers that you showed me the money, and I just averaged it out. So on, on average, and this is just the money raised by the candidates, so I want to be that clear. On average, the moderates were raising about just under $5,000. Whereas the conservatives are raising $4,500. So certainly there seems to be a slight advantage for moderates, but it's pretty extreme in, in, in some places. But let's talk about some seats specifically. Let's talk about Cascade County. What the heck is going, up in, going on in Cascade County? And specifically, let's talk about that Fitzpatrick race up there in Cascade County. Cascade County is ground zero for the civil war that's taking place with the Republican Party right now, and, and particularly Senate District 10. Uh, just as a matter of full disclosure to the viewers, I represent um, in federal court J.C. Kontrovitz. We have had to file a lawsuit in federal court because Steve Fitzpatrick, who is a phony liberal Republican, filed a complaint with Modell that um, my client, Kontrovitz, um, accused Fitzpatrick of being the liberal that he is. Unfortunately, under state law, in order for Kontrovitz to do that, his one-page letter has to have attached to it 50 pages of all the bills that Kontrovitz is relying upon to, to call Fitzpatrick the liberal that he is. What that law does is it makes it impossible for conservatives to challenge and, and criticize the voting records of incumbents, which of course is what that law is intended to do. Let's pull up that, we actually have the mailer. Matthew provided it for us. Here's the mailer, and this is one side of the mailer. 
that was sent out to Extreme from Montana. Now, Mike, the issue that, that Matthew's talking about here is, of course, the Disclose Act, right? Yes. Correct. Yeah, and of course, the issue is that you've got to basically back up your claims with, with evidence from the votes you're drawing upon. So here, so this is, this is getting pretty nasty, though. He's too extreme for Montana, um, and this is getting pretty vicious. And in fact, I looked on the docket of the political, uh, on the commissioner's website, and there were about three or four complaints coming out of Cascade <laughs> County here. Um, as, a, as a Democrat, what do you think about this, Tim? Well, I'd encourage you to keep eating your own. And uh, I think no, it's the liberals that are trying to eat us, and we're fighting back, and we're fighting back in federal court, and and we're winning. Modal has, has suffered serious setbacks in the past few weeks. He's going to suffer additional losses in the next few weeks. Yeah. No, I, I I can just hope that similar disputes break out throughout the state of Montana among you and other Republicans. But they're and, not they're not Republicans. That's the whole point: is that these are phony Republicans masquerading as Republicans. They're actually Democrats, and they are creating havoc for true Republicans like J.C. Controvitz. And, and take it statewide. Well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the liberal phony Republicans are okay. doing exactly that. Now, I think that uh, it, Great Falls is certainly kind of a hotbed of this competition, but I think also another ground zero place is Bozeman. Absolutely. Uh, there's several Absolutely. races that are key races. We have a graphic here of a uh, of a piece that the moderate Republicans group sent out against Representative Art Wittick. Representative Art Wittick voted for dark money. This has gone out in several districts against people who voted against the bill last session to sort of crack down on dark money and, and force more disclosure of certain spending. And we have Art Wittick who's being opposed in the primary. We also have uh, Tom Burnett is being opposed in the primary. We have a, a primary in your old district, Matthew. Uh, and the contractors have come out strongly for all these people, provided them money. Uh, what's going to happen in these races here in Bozeman? How's it going to fall none of these, None of these contractor-backed candidates have ever shown up at a Gallatin County Republican Central meeting. So that, that tells you something right there. These are phony Republicans, again, being financed by the contractors to take on solid conservatives, such as Art Wittick. Uh, the battle cry that you're going to hear in the next few weeks here in, here in Gallatin County is, screw modal, vote Wittick. Because that's, that's the way a lot of Republicans feel. Um, they feel like He's been railroaded, and he was, and there's going to be some retaliatory votes to let Modal know and let Democrats know that we don't want the government telling us who our candidates are and, and who our nominees are going to be. Now, I talked to the fellow who was running against our Wittig, Bruce Grubbs. You're calling him a phony Republican. This is a guy who owns businesses. This is a guy who works with school districts, helping them save money. I mean, how can you call this guy a phony Republican? I would have no problem if Bruce ever showed up at a, at a Republican committee meeting. I've never seen him there. He's never shown up at a Republican committee meeting. He's, he's never given any kind of indication that he takes the Republican Party platform seriously. Art Wittick has stood time and time again for the platform for conservative positions, for the kind of positions that his voters want. That's why, that's why I can call Bruce a phony, because I've never seen him. I mean, that's the problem. None of us have ever seen him at an actual Republican function. Now, Tim, you also live in Bozeman, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, what, what are the Democrats thinking when they're looking from the outside in at this battle going on between Republicans in Gallatin County? Well, I, I can't claim to tell you what the Democrats are thinking necessarily, but what I can say is, you know, the people that the Democrats have recruited, like Jim Hamilton, who's running uh, in my district, you know, he's got a banking background. He's, uh, you know, works in the finance industry. He respects public education. He's just a very, very solid individual. He's, he's not somebody that, you know, kind of plays these partisan games. And I think people eventually are going to start appreciating that more. You, you, what you may want to have is more interesting Republican meetings so people will show up because I don't think a lot of people are showing up these days for the extreme right wing you know, meetings in, in Montana. They're not showing up because they're not Republicans until campaign season rolls around, until the contractors put some money in their pocket, then all of a sudden they do become Republicans. That's the way it's working. Mm -hmm. That's the way Republican voters are getting upset. That's yeah. why they're upset is because the, they see the phoniness for what it is, yeah. and they're tired of it. What's mm -hmm. interesting is I, you know, I, I love data as a political scientist, and looking at that Senate District 10 in Cascade County, uh, they're both a, uh, basically Fitzpatrick, about $23,000. His opponent, Kantorovich, has got sixteen six. So that's a really expensive race. The interesting that Wittick race, Wittick is being outspent, I think, I think it was 8 to 1, 7 to 1 seven in terms one. of money being raised. But of course, that doesn't include any money that's going to come from the outside. But let's, let's move on. And well, one other thing I want to mention is, 
the, you said that this is somewhat a battle between uh, what you call rhinos and ideologically conservative. Chamber of Commerce scores uh, incumbents. And looking at just the incumbents that are being challenged, the average score for the six GOP House members with primary for moderates, the conservative, their score is 76.5. Whereas moderates challenged by conservatives, the average score is 95. So certainly there is this tension between the Main Street Republicans and ideologically conservative. But let's move beyond the primaries to the big picture for the fall, because we have about three minutes left in the program. And I want to go to Tim. What are the chances that the Democrats will pick up seats on either the Senate or in the House? And if you want to put the graphic up real quick, let's show the Senate pie chart. And then, Tim, what do you think? Do, do, the, can Democrats pick up seats in well, the Senate? Well, you know, I, I, I think I'm wearing a tie that has flying pigs on it. And I think that's kind of how people think about the Democrats taking over either the House or the Senate. Pigs may fly this fall. I don't know, but we'll see. I think it's probably likely that in the House, the Democrats will have um, the opportunity to pick up a lot of seats in the general election. Uh, fewer in the Senate, just because there's fewer seats and, and the politics of it are likely to um, you know, keep both houses Republican, but with significant Democratic pickups in the House. Tim, what do you think? Democrats be able to pick up seats or Republicans going to pick up seats in either chamber? Are, are you talking to me or? Matthew. Uh, Matthew, I'm yes. sorry, Matthew. Uh, the, we're going to lose House District 23, more than likely. That is Wendy McCamey's district. She was recruited by the phony liberal Republicans to leave her district and challenge Randy Pinocchi in his district. Unfortunately, that's going to make House District 23 pretty much a, a, a pickup for the Democrats. We may be able to pick up House District 3. Um, Zach Perry is the incumbent Democrat there. Mm -hmm. That is a heavily Republican district. We've got uh, a new guy by the name of Taylor Rose. He's working hard. He's a solid conservative. Uh, he also has the benefit of having a libertarian kicked off the ballot, which cost Jerry O'Neill that seat two years ago. So if Taylor works hard, I think he's got a shot. How's Isn't he also a white supremacist? Uh, yeah, according to uh, your phony cowgirl blog, yes. But uh, the rest of us think of him as a good conservative. Oh. House District 51, uh, this is Margie McDonald's old seat. She's running for the Senate. In Billings. In Billings. Uh, and we've got Adam Rosendale, who's going to be running for that seat. Uh, hopefully he'll get some, some support from uh, his old man being on the ballot. Uh, both of them have, their, have a new set of drones ready. I think that's a, that's a possible pickup for us. Mike, real quick, um, do you think the Democrats will pick up seats in your chamber? We've got about a minute. No, I, I think in the Senate, it's going to, they'll probably lose a seat. Uh, it, it'll be lucky if they, get a t they tie it. I think in the House, um, Democrats will maybe pick up Oh, anywhere from two to five seats. Uh, but it depends a lot on the turnout and uh, what happens with the presidential race as well, I think. What's fascinatingly interesting, if you actually look in 2014, uh, that was a bad year for Democrats nationally in here in Montana. And yet they managed to pick up two seats in the House, which, was, which I think is a testament to the work that they did. Um, one of the things that I try to pay attention to is, I think Matthew can probably attest to this, a lot of us just knocking on doors and getting your name out there and working hard. But another thing that's really important is just what does the district look like? And that's the thing in the Senate. It is really, really hard to see where the Democrats could pick up any seats. And in fact, I think their best shot is probably Elsie Arnson's seat. That was 44% vote for President Obama. I actually do see a path for the Democrats to pick up seats uh, in the House. But in any case, we have a lot more to talk about. Um, thank you for joining us today on Face to State. What we will be doing next time is talking about the ACA in a few weeks after Mike and I take some time off. Thanks and have a great day. You've been watching Face to State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.